Hello, everybody. Nice to see you refreshed after the coffee break. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk to you about the PCV and rotavirus vaccinating introduction options. And some of this will be repetition from what was discussed earlier by Lasane and also Jason. So it'll hopefully be a refresher, but I, I won't spend too much time. Firstly, I think it's important that I explain to you, we've, we've talked about these WHO position papers and SAGE, but I want to explain that the, the level of uh, effort and uh, critical appraisal of evidence that goes into these position papers, it takes a number of years. The working groups, specific disease working groups are formed and they review evidence and it can take two to three years for these um, papers to be, to be put together. And also to emphasize that position papers are published in English and French. So you see here that in black it's in English and in blue they're in French. So they're available for everybody. So for the policy recommendations for PCV, um, the most recent paper was in February 2019. And the schedules are a three dose schedule. So that's either two plus one or three doses for infants starting as early as six weeks with a minimal interval of four weeks between doses. For the two plus one schedule, the booster should be given between nine and 18 months of age and an interval of more than eight weeks is recommended. We've heard much about catch up vaccination um, yesterday and today, but the idea behind the position is that it should be for children aged one to five years and at the time of introduction of PCV and it should really be used with the idea to accelerate the vaccine impact on the disease. And we've heard about the, the, the pre-qualified PCD products. So we have two 10 valent and one 13 valent vaccine. In terms of the recommendations for adults, I think at the moment there's a lot of discussion and thought around life course vaccination, where we want to try and expand vaccination across all age groups. And in um, particularly for pneumococcal, there was a discussion around this because we were seeing a bimodal distribution of pneumococcal disease, whereby children under five and adults over 50 were having increased incidence of, of pneumonia. But there was a working group formed and um, the evidence showed that countries should prioritize PCV in national immunization programs and measures to sustain high coverage. And because of that, we see then there is potential protective effect in the older age groups. And in countries that have mature uh, PCV programs, the decisions on initiating an adult program, which typically use higher valent uh, pneumococcal vaccines, should take, into should take into account the local disease burden, the cost effectiveness, and also the population structure and demographics. In addition, the need for enhanced surveillance is needed to monitor the serotypes in older adults, and also there are additional operational factors. <clears throat> so there was a question earlier this morning about the status of PCV introduction in the African region. And we can see here, this is a global picture of PCV introduction. And we can see that there are 154 member states that have introduced PCV. There's one country that has partially introduced PCV and there are 39 countries globally that are yet to introduce PCV. And the question also came up this morning about, you know, coverage and introdu introducing a vaccine is not enough. As we know, we have to sustain high immunization coverage. And we see that in many countries, they are unable to reach the target above 80% or higher. So there's always a need for continued effort to keep trying to improve your immunization program and increase immunization coverage. In terms of the status and products that are used globally, we see that there is some variation. So 116 countries are using PCV13, whereas we have 25 countries using PCV10 and eight countries using a combination of both and then we have five countries which are using the PCV10 pneumocil vaccine. In terms of the dosing schedules that are in use, we see quite a large majority of countries are using the three plus zero dosing schedule. 
um, whereas the three dose schedule of two plus one is being used quite a lot in the African region. Um, and some countries op opt for a four dose schedule and we see that the United Kingdom has a two dose schedule. Just to show that there is variation and the dosing schedule is something to consider when you are introducing this vaccine. So I'm not gonna to dwell too much on this slide because I think yesterday a lot of discussion was made around um, the cold chain and financial sustainability and supply and availability of vaccines when making considerations. Two areas that I think could also be, uh, or could have more emphasis placed on and also relate to some questions this morning are the ease, ease of use and the expected coverage. So we have to consider the doses per schedule, the doses per vial, the route of administration. And then for the expected coverage aspect, I think this is the most realistic aspect of introducing the vaccine we have to consider. It's the doses per schedule and the impact on healthcare workers to open a vial. So I've done a lot of work on reducing missed opportunities for vaccination. And I've seen in many countries that at a, uh, the end of a session, uh, if there's one child, a health worker is often very reluctant to open a vial. So we need to ensure that our health workers are trained to know that it's better to open that vial and vaccinate that child because we don't know if that child will return. So this is all about the, the practical implications and how we can ensure that we increase coverage. And I know that many of you will say, but then that increases wastage. But I think we really need to think about utilization of the vaccine rather than wastage. Is it better to use the vaccine and have that child protected than thinking about wasting and missing people in our population? So the key questions for PCV introduction and considerations for NITAGs and ICCs are of course about the, the product and presentation, the schedule, whether a catch up campaign will be done at the time of the launch and if yes, when? And also, are there opportunities for integration with other antigens, both for catch-up campaign and for the introduction in routine? So when we talk about in routine, this is whether the launch will be done um, with rotavirus, because they're the same dose schedule in most cases, and there's a high potential for impact. And if introducing PCV and rotavirus together, which presentation will be most preferred? So these are the WHO pre-qualified PCV products. And one additional thing I wanted to mention is that this presentation is also available in French for our Francophone colleagues. So both uh, English and French are available after this um, meeting. So for the WHO pre-qualified PCV products, we see that you know, they're showing the presentation of the, the serotypes that are uh, included in these vaccines. And we see that for, for two vaccines, for the PCV13, the, the Pfizer and the GSK, there are some serotypes that are, are uh, showing that there are cross protection, but, and there's also um, some evidence that there's inconclusive evidence at the moment um, for cross protection. So just to say that depending on the product choice, there is potential for, for cross protection with different serotypes. <clears throat> In terms of the immunogenicity, efficacy, and effectiveness, I think it's been proven that all these three products have shown high levels of immunogenicity and are recommended based on WHO prequalification. And data at the moment are not available for the PCV10. This is the pneumo cell, but we hope that they will be available soon. Um, and then the serotype specific coverage differences we show, as I mentioned, that there is some cross protection for some serotypes. And um, serotype 19A is only present in the PCV13 and in the pneumocell vaccine, but the three PCV products are considered interchangeable. When we consider safety and co-administration, the safety profiles have been reviewed extensively as part of the pre-qualification -qualifi pre process and by the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. I think that vaccine safety is something that is taken very seriously. And both these products, the GSK and the PCB13, have been shown um, to have extensive post-marketing data and have excellent safety profiles. So I think you know, we have to always consider that you know, going through these procedures for pre-qualification and also the review by GACs 
it does show that you know the vaccines are very safe and effective. In terms of the role of catch-up campaigns, I think the considerations that, that are important are that the you know, we look at the timing and that the catch-up campaign should be done just before introducing PCV into routine. Um, and then the, the value of that in terms of accelerating direct and indirect protection and try and reduce the impact of um, pneumonia on the populations. The target population are children one to five years and the doses are typically one single dose is given or two doses separated in at least two, uh, in at least eight weeks. In terms of considerations for catch-up campaigns, um, the implementation aspect in terms of the synergies and budget efficiencies are important if they're timed right. Uh, we also have to consider the use of operational support for long-term strengthening of the routine program. However, we should consider the resource uses um, for catch-up because it can often divert away from routine immunization. We know that any form of campaign impacts on routine because our health workers are taken away from their routine roles and it can have consequences on other populations and actually increase missed opportunities. So we always have to consider how we can do that. And also moderate the vaccine serotype, um, moderate vaccine serotype carriage disease in catch-up age cohort. So we see that there can be some moderate changes um, over time in the age cohorts, as some may have been previously exposed. In terms of catch-up vaccination after introduction, WHO recommends a catch-up schedule for delayed or interrupted vaccination for all antigens in the schedule. And interrupted schedules should be resumed without repeating the previous dose. Catch-up vaccination, as I mentioned, can be done with a single dose of PCV for children greater than 24 months and unvaccinated children aged one to five years who are at high risk of pneumococcal infection because of any underlying health conditions such as HIV or sickle cell disease should receive at least two doses separate, separated by at least eight weeks. WHO does not currently have recommendations on the use of PCV in individuals over five years of age. <clears throat> so WHO published this guidance um, back in 2020 on recommendations and the operational guidance for catch-up vaccination. And it includes key policy and programmatic considerations for implementing catch-up vaccination. And I think catch-up vaccination is a topic that, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. And I think when you're considering catch-up, you have to think about, has your country a policy and a schedule for catch-up vaccination? Are your health workers aware of these policies? Do your health workers implement these policies. If a child comes to your health facility and is 14, 15 months old and has missed out on previous vaccines, will the health worker have the capability and understanding to catch up that child? These are aspects that you need to consider and some of the implementation challenges with all vaccines, because sometimes we find that some health workers are not familiar with these policies. We also have to ensure you have availability of vaccines and supplies. And an aspect that doesn't get discussed a lot <laughs> with catch-up is the data reporting. What happens if a child comes to your health facility who's two years old or older? How will you record that in your, in your um, immunization registries? Will that be captured as part of coverage? Will that child have a home base record? If there's a covered survey conducted, will that be included as part of coverage in your country? Also, as I mentioned, the health worker knowledge aspect about delivering catch-up vaccination is important, as well as acceptability and awareness in the community and amongst caregivers about what their child is, is due and whether what their child is um, eligible to receive. And also, can you think about other um, strategies to identify and reach these missed populations? And I want to also highlight that on the right-hand side here, we have a schedule, that, a table that WHO produces annually or updates annually, depending on any changes, that has recommendations for interrupted or delayed routine immunization. So it shows, these are available in English and French, but these tables show what to do in the case of a delayed or interrupted schedule. And in terms of PC recommendations, I wanted to make you aware that there is a current um, work ongoing 
for a pneumococcal vaccine working group that will be convened this year to review evidence related to schedule optimization, looking also at multi-age cohort PCV campaigns, and also review of available and timelines to licensure uh, pre-qualification of newer PCV products, which are including higher valent with pediatric indications. And these recommendations are expected late 2024 or 2025, which will mean that sometime in 2025, there will be a new position paper for PCV. So that's covering the PCV aspect. And Jason already went through the position paper for rotavirus earlier on, so I will continue on from there and just say that related to the catch-up aspect for rota, I think this is an area that is of big importance because WHO recommends that if a child is under 24 years of age, they recommend that that child is vaccinated. However, if the child is over 24 months of age, vaccination is not recommended. In terms of the upper age limit for rotavirus vaccination, it's higher um, than the age restrictions indicated by manufacturers. So this is considered an off-label recommendation for these products. But this is um, a recommendation that WHO has made based on evidence. So there shouldn't be concern for that. So the need for, vir the need for va rotavirus vaccination for children who uh, with missed, delayed, or interrupted routine immunization is particularly important after significant disruptions to immunization programs and in high mortality or crisis context. So this is something to consider. This is the global picture for rotavirus vaccine introduction. We see that 116 countries have introduced rotavirus and two countries have partially. I should say that Nigeria are not included in this because this is the data from 2021. So 117 countries have introduced rotavirus and there are 75 countries who are yet to introduce rotavirus globally. In terms of the coverage, we see that coverage varies globally with some countries, uh, many countries attaining between 50 and 79%. Um, but I think once again, there are some that are achieving greater than that and we should always strive to achieve higher coverage. So this is a quite a different picture compared to what I showed for PCV. So this shows the, the introduction status and product choice. So we see that there's quite a lot of variation in terms of what countries are using. Um, I'm not going to go through all, but I think the color speaks for itself. We see that there is variation globally uh, in terms of which choice, product choice countries are opting for. And similar to, um, to PCV, these are the considerations for vaccine introduction and the same challenges as I mentioned earlier, so I, I won't need to repeat myself, but again, the question of, about uh, vial size and health workers' hesitancy to open a vial is something that we have to ensure that our health workers are well trained on that. <clears throat> so the key questions for rotavirus introduction or switch decision making is which vaccine presentation to use as there are many options available, as I showed. Are the opportunities for integration with other antigens for introduction in routine immunization, as well as with other health programs? So rotavirus is a particular case because we know that the vaccine can only do so much. In settings where we have water and sanitation issues, many countries have introduced rotavirus with water and sanitation uh, health promotion. And that is actually part of the recommendation in the position paper, but we really don't see many countries doing that. So um, Jason described how you know, the, the efficacy of the vaccine is not as high as others, but I mean, that's why the, the, the consideration of having other water sanitation uh, promotion can improve that and just general child health. So in routine, whether you, you launch the vaccine and routine together with PCV or consider um, if introducing PZ and rotavirus together, which rotavirus uh, vaccine presentations are preferred. So these are the, the similar considerations, both for PCV and for rota. So Jason already showed this, but I want to re-emphasize the point that he made, that the current evidence indicates that local data on circulating rotavirus strains should not drive product choice, as all WHO pre-qualified uh, rotavirus vaccines provide protection against heterologous strains. So I just want to re-emphasize that point, but D Jason already covered this earlier this morning. When we talk about safety considerations and the question was raised this morning, 
Um, you know, all WHO pre-qualified vaccines are safe and effective. And as mentioned this morning by Jason, that you know, the first rotavirus vaccine caused intussusception, and uh, this raised concern about the vaccine use. However, with the new rotavirus vaccines, there seems to be very small increased risk of intussusception in the children following rotavirus vaccination, and this is seen mainly in the first one to seven days following the first dose. And the, it must be considered is the, the benefits versus the risks. Um, the risk of intussusception after rotavirus vaccination is much lower than the risk of severe rotavirus disease in unvaccinated children. So the data continue to be monitored globally, globally as um, Jason mentioned, but there's a lack of uh, intussusception surveillance in many countries, but this should not um, in, be an impediment to rotavirus vaccine introduction. So I've mentioned a little bit about you know, when you deliver um, rotavirus and PCV together, but GAPD, which is a global action plan for prevention and control of pneumonia and diarrhea, which also Jason mentioned this morning, we have to consider this comprehensive approach. How can we try and prevent both these diseases? So there are some, um, so we have the, the aspect of for, for diarrhea, vitamin A supplementation, rotavirus vaccination, making sure there is safe water and improved sanitation, as well as availability of rehydration, um, fluids and continued feeding in terms of treatment. Um, for pneumonia, then we have, of course, the vaccination against um, PCV and also with uh, Haemophilus influenza B and pertussis can also help with prevention of pneumonia, as well as reduced household air pollution, availability of antibiotics for treatment and oxygen therapy where, where indicated. But if we look at the protection part, this is the part that overlaps both diseases. So to protect, ensuring that there is breastfeeding and promotion and support, adequate complementary feeding, for the prevention aspect for both diseases, ensuring that children are vaccinated against measles. They're trained and there's training and support and health promotion around hand washing with soap and prevention of HIV, and then the available of treatments. So just to say that the integration approach is an aspect that many countries are continuing to adopt. And uh, it's been something that has been discussed for many, many decades, but I think the way our programs funding structures and how we operate, we don't generally work as well together with other programs as we should. But we have to think about the individual and that people-centered approach and the, our communities who access our health services, how can we provide them with the most comprehensive set of interventions? So rather than thinking that's only EPI who can do this, how can you work together with other programs to help deliver other health interventions? and ultimately try and ensure that we have healthier populations and people who are not missed out. And then finally, the, the considerations for simultaneous introductions. Um, we mentioned this earlier, but many countries in this room are already considering that, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, but there are just, you know, current countries are encouraged to assess opportunities that may leverage implementation and synergies for budget efficiencies. And just one final, Slide, this is considering the cost considerations of new introductions. You've introduced vaccines in the past, you know that there are incremental costs of adding a new vaccine, and then you have your existing um, immunization program costs. So you have to consider what will be the incremental cost of introducing a vaccine. And just one thing that is not included on this, and something that I'm an advocate of, is the home base record, the vaccination card. What happens when you introduce a new vaccine? Who's responsible for changing the card, who's going to pay for that? There are many different programs working together to have um, information included in the home base record, but sometimes it's, it falls on the immunization program to consider um, those costs, but it's an opportunity also to consider reviewing your home base record or vaccination card and seeing if there's a way to make it more concise and condense and make sure you can incorporate new information. So with that, thank you very much. And um, there were the contacts of further colleagues at WHO.